I was born in Kingsport in 1944 on Watauga Street. Um, well, actually, I was born in the Holston Valley Community Hospital, but we lived in uh, on Watauga Street at that time in the house that my grandparents had built. My grandfather was named William Henry Reed, and my grandmother was Hattie Elizabeth Vanover, and they grew up near Clintwood, Virginia. My grandfather was orphaned at 10 and lived with uh, a sister, and then he ran away to live with some brothers in Kentucky. And um, he was became a teacher, and he met my grandmother, who was his student, and um, they fell in love and got married. She was also a teacher. And he had always wanted to be a doctor for some reason. Um, I think maybe watching his parents die. So uh, she said, well, do it. So he, um, he went to Louisville for like a pre-med course. And um, he used to ride the, hop the freight car home to visit her in uh, Clintwood on the weekends. And then he got a scholarship to the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. And they moved over there, and he worked in the Confederate Veterans Home. And she worked in a department store selling cosmetics. And uh, so he managed to get through med school. Then they went back to Clintwood, and he had a, a stable of horses. I, I've heard that he had six horses, and he used to ride out into the hills on house calls. And they heard about a new town being founded on the Holston River in East Tennessee. My grandfather had his offices up above the drugstore. It was essentially the first hospital in town. There were four four beds. And um, uh, then the Friel's Drug was down below. My father used to work there as a soda jerk. And after a while, uh, my grandfather uh, decided the space was too limited, so he um, uh, started the next hospital out in um, near Netherland Inn and the boatyard apartments, which are still there. That, he turned that into a hospital, so that was the next hospital. And then that became too limited, and he bought uh, a building on the corner of Charlemont and... Um, Oh, I don't know which street, but anyway, it's it, it, and I don't know what it's called now, but it was called the Reed Apartments. But before that, it was a hospital. So that was the third hospital. And then he got involved with the um, other doctors who were founding Holston Valley Community Hospital. And um, so then that hospital became the main hospital. And my father was their only child. He was... Um, three when they moved to Kingsport in 1918. He had been born in Clintwood. And he grew up and went to the local schools, went to Dobbins Bennett, uh, played football, played in the band, um, uh, was Tennessee State Piccolo champion, which is bizarre because he was six feet four inches tall and about 220 pounds. So uh, he played this tiny little piccolo and he said the the kid that played the tuba was about 5'2 and 90 pounds, so there was some kind of mismatch in the band there. Um, then he, George Eastman um, gave scholarships to young men that he considered promising in Kingsport, and he gave out five my father's senior year, so my father got one. Went to the University of Rochester, which is where he met my mother, who was from Rochester, and they married and uh, moved to, he went to Harvard Medical School and then did his um, residency in New York City at what was then the Roosevelt Hospital and is now St. Luke's. And then he went to World War II and when he came home, he was uh, assigned to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. And then in 1947, we moved back to Kingsport, and um, my grandparents had, had built their house in 1926 on Watauga Street, and uh, they gave it to us, and they moved. Um, well, first they moved to a little cabin up above 
where Patrick Henry Dam is now. And then they found a um, what had been a bootleggers nightclub on the hill across the river from the Ridgefields Country Club. So they renovated that and turned it into a house. It was a beautiful house. It had um, a porch all along the riverside. I guess that was where the bootleg pa patrons used to drink their moonshine. But anyway, they moved there and we moved to their house on Watauga Street. And that's where my three brothers and my sister and I grew up in that house. At that time, there weren't a lot of forms of entertainment. I mean, there wasn't even television when, when I was a child. I don't believe we had a TV till I was um, maybe 10. You know, there's this cliche almost about the South that people are good storytellers. But they really are, or, or they really were. <laughs> I think it's uh, probably fading, but people, that was how you entertained yourself. You just sat around uh, at night and and people told little stories, not official stories, but anecdotes. And um, I think that's how Southerners make sense of life. They they don't have they don't do abstract reasoning, which I learned to do in college in the North. They understand life through anecdotes. You know, they'll say, Oh well I was downtown today and I saw this old man and he said such and such and it may be a funny story but it also uh, often has a point, a, a deeper point behind it. So that was how I grew up. And the same thing in church. I mean, um, it, it was such a religious area. Everybody went to church. And um, in the Bible, it's the same thing. The parables are essentially that. They're telling a story that entertains you, but they're also making a deeper point. So that's essentially what a novelist or a short story writer is trying to do. So I think it was a wonderful training for somebody who wanted to be a writer. When I was, when I was small, uh, the other way we entertained ourselves um, was that we had a gang in the neighborhood. There were my, my three brothers. My sister didn't come along till later, but um, we had a couple of boys in the house behind us and a, girl, two, a couple of girls down the street. There were about eight of us or so eight or ten, and we um, played games all day long. Uh, they were kind of like little soap operas. Like one of the neighbors had a playhouse, and we would be a pioneer family, and um, all kinds of uh, tragedies would befall us. We would go hunting, and someone would get shot, or we'd lose a limb, or uh, buffaloes would stampede, or the river would flood, or... Uh, Tornado would come and we'd climb up on the roof or, you know, so we, we played that. We played Civil War. Uh, we had a shed behind my garage and we turned that into a hospital for our Civil War game and we gave each other transfusions. And <laughs> so we just uh, invented stories all day long. And um, so I was doing that from a really young age and I think that that, that was very helpful. My mother was a big reader. She read maybe a book a day. And um, so she would take us every week to the library and they had charts. Um, you'd check out an armload of books, take them home and read them. And you got a silver or a gold star for every book that you read. And once you had a certain number of stars, then you got a bird sticker, you know, a bluebird or a cardinal. Or, and this was really the high point of our lives. Um, sad to say. <laughs> um, th this was just the best. And so we spent a lot of time in that library, and I was so sad when they tore down that building. I wrote my first short story when I was at Dobbins Bennett. I was a feature editor on the school newspaper, the Indian Tribune. And um, I, decided, I had been reading um, William Faulkner outside of class, and I was very impressed with stream of consciousness because I had been uh, Ms. Verb <laughs> in the fourth grade play who was married to Mr. Noun. And I thought you for every sentence you had to have a noun and a verb. So here was this famous writer and he was just doing phrases, you know, like uh, a couple of words and then a period. And so I thought, well, I'll write a story for the Indian Tribune in stream of consciousness. 
So the topic I picked was um, uh, Nathan Hale's hanging for um, uh, during the revolution when he was hanged for being a spy, hanged by the British. And I had him in his jail cell and he was looking out through the bars and he was contemplating the futility of life and uh, how he was really too young to die and this kind of thing. And he was watching the autumn leaves fall to the ground and get crunched under the boots of the soldiers who were marching to come take him to the scaffold. And so it was like um, falling leaves, period. Red, orange, and green, period. And so uh, the whole story was that way. And the advisor was the wife of the sheriff. And um, uh, she said, she called me. I went in there. The story came out in the paper, and it had been completely rewritten. So I went in there, and I said, so what happened to my story? And she said, I bet you thought that was pretty good. <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't think it was so bad that it needed to be rewritten. And she said, let me tell you something, little lady. That story wasn't even written in complete sentences. <laughs> so she had turned the whole story into uh, complete sentences. So that was my first story. But it was actually a, a very good experience because it uh, taught me how to deal with editors. I don't think I had any great urge to get away. I had a wonderful childhood. I mean, it was a, a great place to grow up. But um, when I started looking around at colleges, my brother was at MIT, my older brother, and I always did whatever he told me to. <laughs> and so he said, I, I really think you should go come up here and look at Wellesley. I think that's where you should go. So I went up there, and it was the campus was so beautiful. It was uh, a lot of a lake and a lot of trees and you know it probably reminded me of home so I decided to go there um, and so it wasn't in rebellion against uh, Kingsport that I went up there it just kind of happened <laughs> you know because uh, I, I like the trees I mean life is strange that way you know you never know quite why you make the decisions you do and then they determine the rest of your life but when I had that distance on uh, the South and on Kingsport, um, then I started um, uh, seeing it more abstractly, you know, understanding what it meant to be a Southerner. I mean, when you're, if a fish is in water, it doesn't think about being a fish, but take it out of the water and it realizes that, you know, it's suffocating. <laughs> Um, so it really made me more analytic towards uh, how I had grown up and, and wanting to look at that and see what does it mean to be a Southerner. In my case, I had um, a mother from New York and a father from Virginia. It was a real hybrid upbringing. And um, my, I had a lot of relatives both places, and uh, the, the two cultures then and still really are, were kind of antagonistic towards each other. When I would visit the cousins in the North, they would say Southerners were stupid, and my Tennessee playmates would say that um, Yankees were rude, but I knew lots of rude Southerners and stupid Yankees, so I wasn't entirely convinced. So when I started writing, and still, I was trying to figure out who I was, who I was, who I am. Um, that was behind it all. What does it mean to be a Southerner? What does it mean to be a Yankee? What does it mean to be both? I had fun and, and I got the tools that I needed to have a, a successful career, the career that I wanted, that I chose and wanted to have. And um, yeah, I feel really, uh, really grateful to Kingsport.